Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and today I'll be talking about the medical history and physical, more commonly known as the H&P. By the end of this video, you will be able to describe the content and format of the medical H&P, to be able to compare the oral presentation of an H&P with its written form, and to list specific features that can distinguish a low from a high quality H&P. Although much of what I'll be talking about applies to other situations in healthcare, such as primary care, this particular video will be focused on the H&P of a patient being admitted to the hospital. A recurring theme is that despite medical educators often implying to the contrary, there is a lot of variability in the format of HMPs. These differences can be seen between specialties, between countries, between hospitals, and even between individual clinicians, depending on their own training, experience, and personal preferences. I'll be pointing out some of these common variations as we go, but I won't be able to include every single one that you might encounter. If clinicians in your home country do things a little differently, or if you're working with a faculty member who has different ex expectations of presentations and notes, that's okay but most of the general principles will be universal. To start, let's take a look at some of the most general similarities and differences between the HMP's oral and written forms. First, the similarities. The overall format, including specific sections and their order, is the same. So both have a chief complaint, history of present illness, past medical history, etc. And then the differences. The primary purposes of an oral presentation is rapid communication and real-time decision-making. For example, an intern might give an oral presentation of the HMP either inside or just outside the patient's room, and then the team decides on a recommended plan of care right there and then. Because of a need for efficiency, oral presentations are relatively brief and avoid excessive detail. Exactly how brief will depend on the complexity of the case the scope of your particular team's care, that is, whether you are part of the primary team or a consulting team, how many other patients are waiting to be seen that day, and the personal preference of the senior most clinician present. Another reason for brevity is that if the audience has additional questions on something that was not mentioned aloud, they can just ask the presenter in real time. Oral presentations are also only typically encountered at teaching hospitals where there are multiple clinicians at different stages of experience and training who are caring for the same patient. At a non-teaching hospital, where there is just one physician or experienced APP, there is often not a need for formal oral presentations. In contrast, the primary purpose of a written note is for use as a detailed reference in the event that later review of previous events becomes required for patient care, as well as for communication to members of the broader healthcare team for whom it isn't practical to attend full rounds in person, such as PTs, pharmacists, or case managers, and also to serve as a legal document. For these reasons, the written note is comprehensive. Sometimes people will say, if something wasn't documented in the note, it didn't happen. Written notes are universal, irrespective of practice location. Next, I'll present an overview of the shared general structure of the HMP before going through each subsection in more detail. Although they are not usually referred to as such, in the broadest possible sense, a well-constructed HMP will consist of three sections. The first is the reporting section, where data obtained by the patient is reported as factually and objectively as possible. This is divided into the history, the physical exam, and diagnostics or tests. And each of these is further subdivided. So the history starts with a source of information, then the chief complaint, history of present illness, past medical history, and so on. The exam starts with the vital signs, then a statement about the patient's overall general appearance, and then a subsection for each organ system or region of the body. The diagnostics include blood and urine tests, radiology tests, ECGs, and the like. Besides the reporting section, there is also the problem list. All features of a patient's current presentation and past history, which could impact their health in the future, are placed into discrete prioritized problems 
each of which contains some summary of the state of that problem, followed by a plan for that problem. Now, many HMPs that you will encounter out there in the wild will have just these two sections, a relatively well-standardized reporting section and a shorter, somewhat less standardized problem list. But HMPs that stop here usually feel incomplete in that the listener or reader might understand the plan for the patient, but not necessarily how the presenter or writer came up with that plan from the patient data. For that, we need an assessment, sometimes called an impression, which consists of a brief summary statement and a longer discussion of something called the differential diagnosis, that is, a discussion of the diseases that are most likely causing the patient's condition, if the condition is unknown. The assessment is what links the data in the history, exam, and diagnostics to the problem list and plan. Without an assessment, it's not always easy to follow a student or clinician's train of thought between what the patient is experiencing and the proposed treatment. The more complex the patient, the more critical it is to include an assessment. Together, the summary statement, differential diagnosis, and problem list are referred to as the assessment and plan, or ANP, of the note or presentation. At this point, I'm going to go through each subsection one at a time to explain its content and format. This is the conventional order you'll find these in the medical chart with some mild and inconsequential variability. First up is the source of information. In practice, this is frequently omitted, but when included, it refers to the source of information primarily for the history of present illness and review of systems or the symptoms that the patient has most recently been experiencing. However, it may also include the source of the past medical history, social history, and family history. It sometimes includes the patient's perceived reliability However, one needs to be careful by placing a potentially biasing statement prominently right at the very beginning of the H&P. Some examples. The source of information could read, source is the patient who appears reliable, or for a patient who is currently unconscious, source is the patient's spouse who appears reliable, or source is the patient who appears unreliable due to alcohol intoxication, or Source is the medical chart as the patient is unconscious and family is not immediately available. Where you can run into a problem with statements like this is when you say things like, source is the patient who appears unreliable due to possible dementia or due to limited health literacy. I recommend avoiding statements like this, even if you believe them to be true. Next is the chief complaint. This is the patient's primary reason for seeking medical care usually a specific symptom or symptoms. Although it's just one line of many in the HMP, it is one of the most important, so I'm going to spend a little extra time on it. You will encounter several different formats for this. The most traditional features the patient's own words. For example, quote, I can't catch my breath today. While some old school clinicians still teach this, Today, it is much more common to instead use a short summary phrase, such as dyspnea times one day. In my opinion, using the patient's own words is usually only preferable for psychiatric presentations, in which the patient's specific phrasing conveys its own useful information. For example, when I rephrase, quote, I can't catch my breath today as, quote, dyspnea for one day, no information has been lost there. Whereas imagine if a patient's chief complaint in their own words was, quote, the CIA is controlling my brain with microwaves. It feels like something goes missing if I were to summarize that as just paranoid delusion. I actually recommend a slightly longer and more formally structured chief complaint than most people use in practice. To understand why, I want you to consider what the purpose is of having a chief complaint section that is separate and precedes the patient's full history. The chief complaint is the scaffold around which the audience will place all other information you share with them. As you are presenting the HMP, each piece of data that the audience hears will impact what they are considering in terms of possible diagnoses. If you're talking about abdominal pain and the audience hears that it's episodic 
that makes them consider one group of diseases a little bit more, whereas if they hear that the pain is constant, that makes them consider a different group of diseases a little more. But they still need a starting place, some very basic information that gives the audience an initial probability of certain diseases. In other words, for a patient with abdominal pain, when trying to prioritize the subsequent information from the history and exam, that prioritization will look different for a 30-year-old previously healthy woman than it will for a 70-year-old man with colon cancer. To acknowledge this, my recommended format consists of four components. Age and gender, highly relevant past medical and social history, the primary symptom or symptoms, if there is more than one of equal prominence, and the duration. So for example, Mr. Singh is a 76-year-old man with diabetes and 40-pack years of smoking who presents with right arm weakness and difficulty speaking for two hours. Let's take a look at some examples of poorly worded chief complaints, identify the error, and then see what a revision would look like. Mr. Williams is a 65-year-old man with diabetes presenting with a heart attack. The error here, it includes a presumed diagnosis. A revised chief complaint. Mr. Williams is a 65-year-old man with diabetes presenting with chest pain for three hours. Miss Lee is a 14-year-old girl with no significant past medical history, presenting with diarrhea for one week and hypokalemia. This includes a lab result which was presumably not known at the time of the patient's arrival. Instead, leave the hypokalemia out of the chief complaint. Mix Oku is a 38-year-old non-binary individual with chronic low back pain, peptic ulcer disease, allergic rhinitis, and psoriasis, presenting with an acute abdomen. There are two major errors. First, there is the inclusion of a lot of irrelevant medical history. And second, it focuses on an interpretation of the exam rather than on the patient's symptom. Corrected, it might read, Mix Oku is a 38-year-old non-binary individual with peptic ulcer disease presenting with severe epigastric pain for 45 minutes. In this case, the peptic ulcer disease is left in because it's centrally relevant to the epigastric pain. And last, cough and fever. This provides no context for the symptoms as compared to Ms. Patel is a 90-year-old woman with dementia sent from her nursing home for cough and fever for two hours. There are four additional points to make about the chief complaint. First, not every clinician likes to label chief complaint because the word complaint has a negative connotation. Therefore, it is occasionally referred to instead as the chief concern or primary concern. Although I appreciate the reason for favoring them, I find them to not be accurately descriptive. For example, the primary concern of a patient might be that they are having a stroke but that would not make it a very helpful opening line to the HMP. Second, some clinicians separate the chief complaint into distinct ID and CC lines. For example, ID, 84-year-old man with cirrhosis, CC, hematemesis, that is vomiting blood, for two hours. This is not my personal preference, but it is totally fine. Next, it was very common in the past to include the patient's race or ethnicity within the chief complaint line. The thinking was that there is an association, genetic or socioeconomic, between some diseases and particular racial or ethnic groups. While there is modest truth to that, the impact it has on the probabilities of most diseases is small, and the risk of introducing bias into the diagnostic process is non-trivial. As a consequence, it is now frowned upon to include race here. Instead, if the patient's self-identified race or reported ethnic background is directly relevant to the diagnostic process, it is better to include it in the social history. Otherwise, it's fine to omit entirely. Last, for transgender individuals, there is the question of whether to include that piece of information in the chief complaint. For example, Ms. Fleming is a 35-year-old transgender woman presenting with spontaneous epistaxis. Anything related to gender identity, no matter how small, has potential to generate strong opinions. My opinion here is that a person being transgender should only be included in the chief complaint if it significantly impacts the differential diagnosis due to potential organs involved or hormonal treatments. So, Ms. Fleming is a 35-year-old woman. 
for a transgender individual, any surgeries they've had go into the past medical or surgical history like they would for anyone else. Any hormonal treatments go into the medication list and any statements about the individual's gender identity goes into the social history. Moving on to the history of present illness or HPI for short, it is the story of why the patient is seeking medical care at this particular time. It is usually composed of pros in chronological order, beginning from when the patient was last in their usual state of health. It often begins literally with the phrase, the patient was in his, her, or their usual state of health until. The HPI should include key events in the evolution of the patient's new symptoms, and each symptom should be described in as much detail as possible. So, for example, the location of a symptom, the timing, its onset, its duration, severity, quality, and the factors which aggravate or alleviate it. If part of the patient's past medical history is centrally relevant to understanding the current symptoms, it is appropriate to briefly mention it within the HPI. Also include how the current illness is impacting their overall life and well-being. At the end of the HPI, one should describe the patient's perception of illness, abbreviated PPI. There are two components to the PPI. First, what does the patient think is most likely causing their symptoms? And second, what is the patient most concerned about their symptoms? So a patient presenting with a new onset headache might think it's most likely a migraine based on descriptions they've read online, but they might be most concerned that it's a brain tumor. Or maybe their biggest concern isn't about a specific diagnosis, but rather the impact the symptom is having on them now or at some point in the future. There is a common variation on the HPI in which instead of pros, the HPI is conveyed as a series of dates and events. In the literature, this format is known as a chronology of present illness, but in practice, it's still referred to as the HPI. This format works well for unusually complex presentations involving previous hospitalizations or adjustments to medical therapy in the days and weeks leading up to the present day. The past medical history, abbreviated PMH, is what it sounds like. It's the collection of both chronic ongoing medical problems as well as previous problems, which may not be ongoing per se, but which might still impact a patient's health. The PMH should always be in the form of a list rather than prose. You should provide details of each item in proportion to the relevance to the HPI, including chronic disease markers when relevant. For example, if a patient has a history of heart failure, mention the patient's ejection fraction on most recent echocardiogram. For a patient with diabetes, mention their most recent hemoglobin A1c. And for a patient with chronic kidney disease, mention their baseline creatinine. If a medical diagnosis in the patient's history is completely resolved and of absolutely no ongoing relevance at all, omit it. There are two very similar variations to how the PMH is documented in the written note. In one, the entire section is called Past Medical History, with subheadings for medical, surgical, OBGYN, and psychiatric. In the other, there is no one umbrella heading containing all of them, and each is considered its separate section. Either of these are perfectly fine. Medications are straightforward. Group meds by common indication or by primary organ system on which they act. It makes it much easier for the audience to remember and to identify if a typically indicated medication class is missing. Include over-the-counter meds and any supplements the patient's taking. During the oral presentation, include doses and frequencies of just those meds that are relevant to the HPI, whereas in the written note, include doses and frequencies of everything. Report patient adherence to meds. I often describe this by asking the patient how many days a week they forget one or more medications. And always use generic names of meds. The generic medication suffix will help with identifying the medication class. For example, any drug ending in olol is a beta blocker, while those ending in statin are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. Also, formal exams almost always use generic names, and it will help your performance to become familiar with them. After meds comes a section called allergies, but which is better considered to be adverse drug reactions. That's because most allergies 
are actually not true allergies in the immunological sense, but are rather side effects. List the specific reactions to each med here, if known. The social history is a relatively variable section, depending on the complexity of the patient and the relevance of these factors to the HPI. Importantly, it is not limited to bad behaviors, for example, smoking, alcohol, and illicit drug use. It also includes marital status, where the patient lives and with whom, their occupation, diet, including food insecurity, animal exposures, travel history, gender identity, and sexual history, unless relevant to the point of being a separate section entirely. For substance use, always try to quantify how much, how often, for how long, and when was the last time. During an oral presentation, the presented social history is usually limited to active alcohol and drug use and whatever is directly relevant to the HPI. For the family history, focus on first and second degree relatives with diseases that are associated with established familial risk such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, particularly if early onset, diabetes, psychiatric disease, substance abuse, and of course, any single gene disorders. If the patient's second cousin, once removed, has gout, please do not include that. For the oral presentation, it is okay to simply state, if true, family history is non-contributory, meaning it's not relevant to the patient's current presentation. And the last traditional section of the history is the review of systems, or ROS. This includes any symptom the patient has been recently experiencing, which, in your assessment, is not directly relevant to the HPI. If a symptom was relevant to the HPI, it already should have been mentioned there, and it does not need to be mentioned here again. Historically, the ROS was considered to be a significant and essential component of the HMP, but its importance has recently been de-emphasized, with clinicians favoring using that time to ask and document more details about the HPI. Having said that, one advantage for students and interns to continue including a thorough ROS is that a relative lack of experience makes it difficult to always discern which symptoms are or aren't relevant to ask about given a particular chief complaint. While the written note should theoretically list every symptom asked about, for the oral presentation, only list those symptoms that are present and not otherwise accounted for. Now, I will move on to the physical exam. Always report what you observed as objectively as possible using proper medical terminology and avoiding editorialization. The written note should contain every maneuver performed and observation made, whereas the oral presentation should focus on those findings relevant to the HPI and to the patient's past medical history. To see how to do that, let's take a look at a documented physical exam for a hypothetical patient. So imagine we are caring for a 52-year-old woman with a past medical history of chronic hepatitis C who is now presenting with suspected bacterial endocarditis. First of all, observe the general format and order of information. This is how the exam might look in the medical record. There is a relative consensus on starting with the patient's vital signs, followed by a statement of their general appearance, or vice versa. This is followed by a line for each anatomic region or organ system. I've heard people describe the order as roughly head to toe, but it really isn't since the subsections for neuroderm and psych are all often listed near the end. As that implies, once you move below vitals and general appearance, the precise order is not entirely standardized. Now, regarding what information to include in an oral presentation, don't include everything. While there will be a range of opinions by faculty on this, no one who you encounter on the wards during your clerkships is going to want to hear the full physical exam as you would document it in the chart. Instead, consider what is relevant. I think about four categories of relevant exam information. First, what is directly related to the patient's chief complaint and HPI? suspected endocarditis in this case. Endocarditis causes murmurs and a host of peripheral findings related to septic emboli and immunological phenomena. Next, what are some common complications from the suspected primary problem? Endocarditis can cause many issues, but heart failure is one of the most notable ones, so include findings that address 
that potential secondary diagnosis. Then there is the information related to the patient's comorbid conditions. In this case, she has chronic hepatitis C, which puts her at risk of developing cirrhosis, which if present, could complicate treatment of endocarditis. So the oral presentation should include findings directly related to the question of whether cirrhosis is present. And last are the findings that provide insight into the severity of the patient's overall condition, so vitals, general appearance, whether the patient is alert and oriented, and how well they can walk should be included for everyone. And there you have the subset of exam maneuvers and observations to include in an oral presentation. When it comes to diagnostics, in an oral presentation, highlight only those results which are relevant to the HPI or which are necessary to understand the reasoning behind the assessment and plan. In the written note, all recent results should be listed irrespective of immediate relevance. With reports such as radiology or pathology, for a presentation, briefly summarize the findings. When it comes to the written notes in the era of electronic medical records, it is extremely common for the entire official report to be copy and pasted directly into the HMP. However, I think it's still preferable in the written note for you to summarize the report in one to three sentences or lines as long as it's not expected for the HMP to be physically printed and used as a standalone record of the patient's hospitalization for some reason. When summarizing findings, only binary tests should be reported as positive or negative. Non-dichotomous tests are normal or abnormal, and if abnormal, summarize the abnormality. So while an HIV screening antibody can be positive or negative, avoid saying things like CT head negative, or UA positive. Otherwise, doing so risks ambiguity over what they were negative or positive for and by what criteria you were using to make that determination. Although it isn't a traditional part of the HMP, it has become standard practice for patients who are being admitted through the emergency room to include a section for ER course. This is usually a bulleted list of treatments provided to the patient in the ER, plus or minus the major exam or test findings and plus or minus the ER suspected diagnosis that led to those treatments. In my opinion, the most appropriate place to include the ER course in the HMP is here, at the very end of the reporting section. However, in my experience at my home institution, most interns seem to prefer to include it at the end of the HPI. Now, while there is value in summarizing the ER course prior to reporting your physical exam, since treatments given before you saw the patient may dramatically impact your exam findings. This has a tendency to bias the audience towards the ER's diagnosis, a form of cognitive bias called diagnostic momentum or momentum bias. It also makes any objective data you subsequently present feel redundant. So everything up till now has been part of the reporting section. While the reporting section includes some subtle interpretation in what the presenter or writer chooses to include, and how they ordered and framed that information, most of this has been data that's been provided by the patient or the medical record. Now comes the transition to you focusing on your thoughts about the case. To make that transition, it is extremely helpful to include something called a summary statement. The summary statement consists of several sentences that link the most important key features of the history, exam, and tests into higher order structure that allows one to formulate a differential diagnosis. As with the chief complaint, I think a good summary statement conforms to a specific formal format consisting of four parts. Age and gender, followed by highly relevant past medical and social history. So far, this is identical to the chief complaint. But then it diverges with a summary of the patient's primary symptoms using distinguishing adjectives called semantic qualifiers. And then it ends with a summary of objective findings with interpretation and groupings into clinical syndromes when relevant. In short, the first half addresses the question of who is the patient, and the second half addresses the question of what is their disease. Let's compare a chief complaint and summary statement for a hypothetical patient. Her chief complaint. Ms. Gonzalez is a 55-year-old woman with a history of metastatic breast cancer who presents with dyspnea and chest pain for two hours. 
And then, after the subsequent history exam and diagnostics were presented, a summary statement for this patient might read, Ms. Gonzalez is a 55-year-old woman with a history of metastatic breast cancer, presenting with acute, constant, non-positional dyspnea and right-sided pleuritic chest pain. Objective data includes hypoxemia to 80% on room air, a normal chest X-ray, and evidence of right heart strain on exam and ECG. In practice, you'll find a lot of variability with the summary statement. For example, some are as short as a single phrase, while some are five to six sentences long. Since your audience, irrespective of whether the HMP is being delivered as an oral presentation or as a written note, has already been introduced to all of the data, you want to minimize repetition, which is a common mistake students make. Don't just repeat stuff, interpret it. Use it to tell a story, albeit a very brief one. As a general rule of thumb, a well-constructed summary statement will communicate your leading diagnosis without you needing to explicitly state it. For example, to go back to Ms. Gonzalez, the way in which I framed her story would allow an experienced clinician to conclude that I suspect she has a pulmonary embolism. The summary statement should be followed by a discussion of the differential diagnosis, that is, the list of roughly four to six possible diseases that could explain the patient's presentation with an explanation of the evidence for and against the leading contenders and a commitment to the single most likely diagnosis based on the available data. Together, the summary statement and the discussion of the differential is referred to as the assessment or occasionally as the impression. After the assessment comes the problem list, which is the last part of the HMP and the most important. As with summary statements, a complete discussion of problem lists is outside the scope of this particular video. But in brief, it is a prioritized list of any aspect of the patient's current or prior medical conditions, social history, or family history, which is either impacting their health currently or which could do so in the future. The first problem listed should be the one that must be addressed most urgently, which is usually, though not always, directly connected to the chief complaint and featured in the summary statement. Symptoms, physical signs, and test results, which you believe share a common pathophysiology and treatment, should be grouped together with that problem given the label of the shared pathologic process. So, if a patient presents with acute fever and cough, is observed to have tachycardia and hypoxemia on exam, and a lung consolidation on chest x-ray, all of those findings could be lumped together under the problem of pneumonia. Here's an example of a problem list for a patient being admitted to the inpatient medicine service. Note how every problem is followed by a brief statement of its underlying cause and or current severity, and then a plan for that problem. A problem's plan could include additional diagnostic tests, treatments, or less commonly patient education. The plan for each problem should be as specific as possible. So if a patient has pneumonia, the plan specifies which antibiotics are being used and the anticipated duration. If the patient has tests ordered, the plan isn't just, quote, monitor labs or imaging. Instead, it specifies which labs and if they are recurring, their frequency. And for imaging, it specifies the region of interest and imaging modality. For meds which have more than one possible dose, specify the specific dose. You may not know all these details when you're first starting out as a first or second year student, and that's okay, but this is the goal of what you should be striving for as a student on clerkships. As with other sections of the HMP, there are variations to the assessment and plan. In the first of these two notable variations, the plan isn't organized by problem list, but rather by organ system. So there is a separate section for the neural plan, the respiratory plan, the cardiovascular plan, and so on and so forth. This is typically seen in the critical care setting only. In the second variation, most commonly seen in unusually complex patients with numerous overlapping acute problems and acute diagnoses, there isn't a differential diagnosis discussion immediately after the summary statement, and instead, each new active problem has its own separate differential discussion. 
So now we are nearing the end. And I know this has been a ton of information to throw at you in one go. No one will expect you to remember every aspect of the format during the first, second, or even 10th time you do this. But the more practice you do, the more natural it will become. I'm going to conclude with a list of common pitfalls that early students make with composing and presenting h &Ps. Deviating from the standard format. If a faculty member specifically tells you to do something different, listen to them, but otherwise stick to what I've presented here. Too brief of an HPI. Unless your patient is comatose, the history should contain enough information on its own for a preliminary differential diagnosis. For an oral presentation, a good rule of thumb is that the HPI should be the longest section up until the assessment. Not including a summary statement. Including a summary statement that is too long and repeats small details of minimal relevance. Insufficient discussion of the differential diagnosis. Remember, it's not just a list of diagnoses. You need to convince the audience those diagnoses belong on the differential including a finding in the problem list that was not already mentioned earlier. Likewise, not including a major abnormality in the problem list that you had mentioned earlier. For example, if you reported in the diagnostic section that the patient's sodium was 115, and then you go through the entire assessment and plan without any reference to it, your audience will assume that you don't know that a sodium of 115 is concerning. And last, presenting the HMP by reading it directly from your written note. Your written note should be more detailed than your oral presentation. If it's not, either the note is too short or the presentation is too long. That's it for this marathon overview of the structure and content of the medical HMP. Check out other videos in this series for discussions on soap notes, discharge summaries, and example oral presentations.